All right. Kia ora koutou. How is everybody today? I hope everyone is happy and healthy in whatever uh, level they're in around the country. Um, cool. Nice thumbs up there from Fiona. Awesome. So, um, obviously, we've had to move this online. This was originally going to be an in person now crowd event, but um, COVID put a stop to that. But that's fine. We've uh, pivoted, and here we all are. Um, I, don't, I hope you're all at home ready to hear some more sustainability stuff and um, hopefully learn a few new things today. Um, we've got some excellent speakers, so you'll love to hear from all of them covering a few different areas of sort of the waste system in New Zealand and how you can be um, a positive part of it instead of, you know, continuously adding to the landfill. Um, we are going to also um, then have a Q&A portion. So throughout the um, event, while people are speaking, if you suddenly go, oh, that's interesting, I'd like to know more about that, you can um, pop it in the chat. And at the end, we'll look through that and ask any questions. You can either do that um, through the sort of public part, or if you just want to send it through to me, um, if you don't want it to be public, if you'd like an anonymous question, that's also fine. Or at the end, um, we can also have if you want to pop your camera and your mic on, you can ask them in person and um, whatever suits you best. Um, also, just so you know, I think it all told you when you came in, but this is being recorded and we will um, be publishing that um, onto the SBN website. So if you are happy with that, fantastic. If you don't want to be um, viewed, just keep your microphone off and your camera off and just be a listener in. Um, great. Well, Everyone who's joining, I think, should be nearly here by now so we can kick off. Um, our first speaker of the day is going to be Ruth from Junk Run. So she's going to give us a fantastic presentation. Um, and then we're going to go to Kate from um, SBN, the Sustainable Business Network. She works in our circular economy team. And then we're going to go um, to Nada from Again Again. So I'll let our lovely speakers kick off with Ruth. Um, so Morning. take it away, Ruth. Thanks so Kia much. Kia ora, everyone. Hope you're all well. I'm going to try and share a screen. Hopefully this all works. Um, can we all see that slide of the team, Junk Run team? Hopefully. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so yeah, I'm the general manager of a sustainable waste management company based in the Auckland region called Junk Run. And uh, that's some of our team there on the screen. Uh, we operate in the, in the Auckland region and we handle construction waste. Uh, we handle commercial office clearances, um, deceased estates from residential. And also if you're moving house or having a big clear out. So we do the commercial construction and residential markets. So we're on the coal face of the reality of what's actually happening out there in the waste industry. Just a bit of background. Um, we we generate in New Zealand around three over well over three million tons of waste every year, which ends up going into landfill. So we are one of the worst producers of landfill in the OECD. And the way I look at that is, I, I I'm a visual person, so in my mind I'm thinking about 126,000 of the largest shipping containers is roughly what we're putting into the ground in New Zealand every year, or 15,000 Auckland buses. So it's a staggering amount, and only 20% of that is actually household waste. The rest, or curbside waste as we call it in the industry, the rest is commercial and construction waste. Um, and at the moment, the construction sector in particular is booming, and so as, therefore it does create a lot more waste. That's a whopping 740 kilos of waste per person per year. And that picture there is the Fox River landfill disaster and the volunteers cleaning up after that chaos um, in the South Island after that negative weather event a few years ago. So I thought I way of background, I thought I'd just fill in for those people who are not so familiar with the waste industry. Um, we only have a certain number of landfills in New Zealand and they are mainly owned by the same companies that own the big skip bin fleets in New Zealand. So notably um, the company Waste Management, which I think everybody's well familiar with, with the orange skips and orange and red trucks. Uh, they own 
two of the biggest landfills in the Auckland region and are about to, I believe, get resource consent to open a controversial new site up in the Kaipara Harbour area between um, Walkworth uh, area, the Dome Valley. So uh, hopefully you can join a few dots up and understand that when stuff goes into a skip for waste management, it, you will go to their landfill um, because it's all connected. And down in the Waikato region, you've got Enviro NZ, which also own a large number of the skip um, skips in New Zealand that own a big landfill down in the Waikato. So I challenge any of you who live in Auckland next time we're allowed to travel <laughs> and you're allowed to go over the Bombay Hills, have a look at how many two truck and trailer units you see going up and down those um, hills uh, hauling waste. And they're basically hauling waste down to the Hampton Downs Waikato landfill which is a little bit cheaper to dump in than it is in Auckland region. So it's just something to keep an eye on next time you're traveling over the Bombays. So waste management is owned by a big Chinese company called Beijing Capital with huge resources internationally. And then EnviroNZ is owned by a Hong Kong um, billionaire called La Ki La Li Ka Xing, um, again, with huge resources uh, internationally. So those are some of the biggest players in the market um, that we work alongside in this um, Auckland region. Now, Auckland Council has a very inspiring goal to have Auckland City at zero waste by 2040. So there is some good stuff happening, um, but in my opinion, it's not happening fast enough to get us to that goal on time. And unfortunately, lockdowns don't help either. But um, one of the biggest challenges we have in the New Zealand market is that we are actually one of the cheapest places in the world to dump rubbish. Um, by that, I mean, there is a, in most countries around the world, there is a waste levy, which is a form of tax that's added to um, any material that's dumped into a transfer station that goes to landfill. Uh, the waste levy in New Zealand was doubled in July this year. It went from $10 to $20 New Zealand per ton. Um, as opposed to just a comparison, if you are dumping waste in New South Wales, you're being charged $146 Australian per tonne that you dump, and you've been charged in the UK and Europe with the equivalent of $200 New Zealand dollars per tonne to dump for landfill. And all that uh, money that's collected is then put back into the system um, to fund really cool recycling, reuse, and waste reduction schemes. So, Fundamentally, that's a big challenge here in New Zealand because we just don't collect that money to then reinvest in finding solutions to our problem. And this article here was just picking up on pre-COVID, the number of uh, cruise ships that used to come to New Zealand and they used to literally stack up all their rubbish until they get to New Zealand because it is the cheapest place in the world to get rid of it. So they dock at our um, ports in New Zealand and empty out all the plastic pool lounges, the plastic pool furniture, you name it, it's all been collected up and dumped here in New Zealand because it's one of the cheapest places to do that. So there's a lot of uh, not so great stuff happening that is challenging at the moment, um, but there are some good things happening. So with our process here at Junk Run, um, we hand sort and separate and load everything. And we've been in existence since 2005. And we believe that stuff should be um, saved and reused as a big priority or recycled as a second priority. So we've got um, strategic partnerships with well-known charities and social enterprises who we know can um, reuse and gift the things that we are sending on to them. Um, so a very large proportion of what we handle actually never makes it to landfill. We actually make sure it gets reused, reallocated or recycled, which takes an awful lot of hard work um, and, uh, a, a very high level of professionalism from the team that we operate with on the front line to know what they're looking at. We, we use the waste hierarchy in our business where our most preferred option is to get stuff reused rather than recycled. Recycled, as you see on that sort of triangle picture there, is sort of halfway down the waste hierarchy and the least preferred option at the bottom is to send stuff to landfill. But as we do have some big challenges, um, some of the, especially at the moment with the amount of construction and commercial clear outs that are happening. One of the biggest challenging um, materials is MDF or custom wood, which you see everywhere. Uh, it's in our kitchens, it's in our bathroom furniture, in our cabinetry. It's also pretty much every uh, office desk, 
or set of drawers. It's in retail fixtures and fittings. And MDF is um, basically custom wood and it's glued bits, to, bits and pieces glued together. And one of the uh, chemicals used to make the glues and resins is unfortunately a chemical called formaldehyde, which is incredibly toxic and certainly can't go into be recycled um, because it releases too much nasty stuff. So the recycling opportunities are pretty much non-existent for, uh, for MDF and custom wood. And it does also get damaged very easily by, um, when you take it apart, it falls to bits. And also if it gets wet, it damages very easily. So that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, we're able to get a lot of that rehomed through charities and community groups that we work with, but it, we have to basically fundamentally change what we're buying, and reduce what we're buying in that particular material to make a big difference there. Um, and also what, what we see a lot of happening here is other companies collecting up items and saying they're being reused, but actually they're being stuck into shipping containers and sent up to our friends at the Pacific Islands. Um, something that we're not particularly comfortable with because a lot of materials going up there are not necessarily suitable for tropical island conditions. Our Pacific Island neighbours don't necessarily have the controls over the landfill uh, or even landfills full stop. Um, so at end of life, um, these are not being properly disposed of in safe, safe environments. They're being dumped into the sea or literally straight into the ground, which is not ideal at all. Um, with Junk Run, what we do is also keep a very close record of everything we collect. Everything we collect off a job is entered into an iPad and goes real time to our office. So we're able to pull data left, right and centre on what we've collected from each job. And the bigger picture of what we've collected so far for the year or going back over many years we want, we're able to see patterns um, and we can see how much has been recycled, how much went to landfill, how much was reused. And we see in time and time again, the types of materials that we struggle to find the right homes for. Um, and we can also do carbon offset reporting as well because the items that we don't send to landfill, we can um, sequester the carbon and keep track of that as well. There's some of the clients that we work with, um, some of our corporate partners. Um, and yeah, our, our strap line or our belief in this world is that we send junk to a better place and it doesn't have to end up in landfill. It really does come down to being sorted and separated properly and carefully and knowing where to take stuff and having the ability to have staff that know what they're doing to be able to make sure that things get to the right place. So that's a little bit about Junk Run. You can find us on social media. You can find us on our website and you can message me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Here we are. Kia ora. Thanks, Ruth. That was excellent. Um, I think it's really useful for us to understand the bigger picture before we kind of can think about our individual actions. It's nice to understand the actual system that we're trying to uh, work in to make positive change. So um, it's always shocking hearing those numbers, though. I mean, it's, it's just insane what's currently happening. But um, hopefully, you know, we're going to hear as well some positive stuff and it's excellent to hear how much of a difference Junk Run is making and seeing those um, numbers of how much you guys are able to divert. Wow, it's, it's, you just wish everyone was doing that. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, next, I'm going to pass along to Kate from um, the Sustainable Business Network. Kate, take it away. Oh, can everyone see my screen all right? Yeah, perfect, Kate. Awesome. Kia ora tātou, ko Kate Hesapoff Aho. I'm a Senior Project and Partnership Manager at the Sustainable Business Network. And my key area of focus is in waste and circular economy. Um, this is our global greenhouse gas emission um, profile. So on the left in the dark blue, we've got all of the emissions that come from energy, energy for buildings, energy for transport, and energy for electro like electricity, like our, you know, what turns the lights on. On the right-hand side, um, this is the, the emissions that are attributed to the production of goods and management of land. So when we're, when we're looking at a strategy to combat climate change, 
Um, right now, a lot of our strategy kind of focuses on a transition to renewable energy. So that 55% in the dark blue, but doesn't really look at the other 45% in the production, extraction of materials and consumption of goods. And so how do we tackle that other 45%? we kind of need to transition and really quickly to a circular economy. So right now we're working in a linear economy where we're taking natural resources from finite resources often, um, making them into products that we design for a really short, for using for a really short period of time and then disposing of them into landfill. We need to transition to a circular economy where we use uh, resources and, and energy from renewable sources um, and make them into products that are designed to last for a really long lifetime and then um, return them for recycling or remanufacturing back into products again. <laughs> cool. So yeah, circular economy is an economy where waste and pollution are designed out, products and materials are kept in use and natural systems are regenerated. So SBN's been working on the circular economy since 2014. And in 2014, we identified six focus areas that would be required to shift New Zealand to a low carbon circular economy. Um, since then, we've done a, a number of other, other bits and pieces of work. In 2018, we released another report that, that came back to these kind of six leverage points and also identified that there's a huge economic opportunity with the transition to a circular economy. I think in Auckland alone, the, the um, economic opportunity is $8.8 .8 billion. Um, and now we're about to launch on the 22nd of September, Go Circular 2025, which is our latest program that's going to help to create tools and resources for businesses to be able to transition to a circular economy. Uh, the first step in that program is that we've done a State of the Nation report, which will be released on that 22nd of September date. So put it in your calendars and come along to the launch. Um, where we've come back to these six focus areas and identified where New Zealand is currently at. So the first one is designing for circular outcomes. And for this, we mean true circular outcomes, not just focusing on recycling. More than 80% of all product related environmental impacts are determined during the design phase of the product. So we need to design products that obviously meet functional needs, but those solutions need to use less resources and focus on materials that are safe and renewable and already in use. They also must be designed to last longer um, and easily repaired and reprocessed when they reach end of life. We all have a role in stimulating the demand for more circular solutions by purchasing products and services that support a circular economy. Um, this is fundamental and it's a role we can all play and um, especially important for businesses uh, where, where you're procuring goods and services, look for, for business models that operate um, circular practices. We need to uh, adopt business models that promote circular practices. So this includes models such as product as a service where the consumer buys a service rather than a product. Um, it can also include the reuse of products and materials in a business model and also uh, is attributed to the sharing economy, which we all know um, the awesome example of Uber. We need to establish accessible infrastructure. So uh, as Ruth so clearly pointed out, the infrastructure in New Zealand for waste reprocessing is really limited. Um, and doesn't necessarily uh, look to solutions that are higher up the waste hierarchy. So we, we have some um, limited recycling facilities, but, but not, none of the available infrastructure that would be needed for things like reusable systems and repair systems. So that includes the logistics, um, as well as soft infrastructure, such as data capture. We need to embed new technology, and this, this will help us make the transition faster. So um, the marriage of physical and digital technology, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, and 3D printing, um, is all enabling a technological you know. revolution. Uh. <laughs> and this is fundamentally altering the way that we work. I think somebody's got their microphone off mute there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and finally, developing uh, policy and legislation. Um, we need policy and legislation that will help to enforce um, a transition to a circular economy and incentivize good behavior and decentivize bad behavior from businesses and individuals. 
So um, my work at SBN has really been focused on packaging and packaging is a really good place for us to start um, our transition to kind of circular business models and, and circular um, thinking. I really like this, well, I don't really like it, I really hate this statistic, but um, globally we use 530 billion single use cups. Uh, and if we stacked them end to end, that would go to the moon and back 85 times. It doesn't really seem like a very good use of resources. Surely we can design things better and systems better so that instead of using single use cups, we use reusable systems. So the bottom line is that any product that's designed to be used for a matter of minutes and then thrown away is not a sustainable option. And that's regardless of whether it's made from plastic, paper, metal or plants, whether it's compostable or not. It's not just single use plastic that's the problem here, it's single use itself. Um, and that's something that we're really trying to drive home uh, with a lot of our, the businesses that we're working with um, when they're looking for a new solution. So plastic obviously has been made kind of the, the poster child for um, waste and rightly so. We're, we're looking at a future where there's going to be more plastic in the ocean by, than fish by, by 2050. And I think we all eat um, during one week about a credit card size of um, plastic. And so we really, this is an area that we do really need to tackle. Um, Plastic itself is not, not the devil, it's the, the systems that we have in place to capture the material. Uh, in New Zealand, one, two and five are relatively easy to recycle plastics, um, but there's caveats to that. So for example, clear number one plastic has the highest value to recyclers, uh, whereas coloured number one plastic has little to no value to recyclers and often finds its way um, uh, but the recyclers often have to pay people to take it away. Um, number four plastic is uh, what our, so our soft plastics are made from. So things like our bread bags and our old plastic bags that we had at the supermarkets. Um, these are not recyclable curbside. When they get into the curbside recycling bin, they um, get stuck in the machinery for some of the reprocessing facilities, the recycling facilities. So we need to um, collect up all of our soft plastics and there is a program called the Soft Plastics Recycling Scheme in New Zealand. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. It's in our, um, our supermarkets and you can just collect them all up and take them back when you go for your next shop. Uh, plastics three and six are really problematic plastics. Um, number three is uh, toxic and number six is breaks off into little pieces and often winds up in the environment. Uh, the government's doing some really good work to phase out um, number three and number six packaging. Um, and number seven is kind of all other plastics. So that includes your PLAs or your plant-based plastics, but also includes things like nylon. Um, and those are put into this number seven category as they are uh, difficult to recycle and um, often due to the fact that they're used in, in kind of smaller quantities and so don't have the, the commercial viability. Cool. Composting. So um, food scraps going to landfill generate, uh, like break down in anaerobic conditions and generate methane, which is a greenhouse gas. Whereas food scraps that we compost in anaerobic, uh, in aerobic conditions, um, they actually can uh, absorb carbon dioxide and help us combat ch climate change. So it's a bit of a no-brainer if you don't already have a compost system set up, then I definitely recommend doing so. But when it comes to packaging, compostable packaging uh, isn't really the answer. I mean, have a look at this picture here. It's um, how, how do we think that that is a good solution is to, to make food producing soil out of um, a whole bunch of packaging? So it's kind of come to the attention that compostable packaging doesn't provide nutrients, but it can actually help deliver food waste to soil. Um, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to compostable packaging. We don't have standards, um, any standards. We don't have like, like a agreed certification here in New Zealand. We've got limited collection systems. A lot of people don't know how to compost. And there's a lot of variation in the products and materials that we're using. And some of them um, may even be harmful. And so what I would kind of say is that, yeah, there might be some applications where compostable packaging um, can work when you're delivering food waste to soil, but 
but in general, it, it's not the um, silver bullet that, that maybe we thought it was when it first came to market. And um, the picture of the knife and fork there, that is um, from living, uh, a picture that was taken by Living Earth, one of our commercial composters. And they, that's a, a compostable cup cutlery that has gone through 12 weeks of the, their um, composting facility and didn't break down. So just an example of the, the huge variation that can be seen. Cool. Um, and so the solution to me really is to go towards reusable models. Uh, this is a graph on the left of the CO2 impacts of various cups. And we can see that if we use ceramic, stainless steel or glass reusable um, options, we can save significantly in carbon di dioxide that we are producing. Um, and this is just a little um, screenshot of uh, some impacts that we can have by switching to reusable coffee cups from the Keep Cup website. Um, as an individual, if you drink five takeaway coffee cups in a week, you'll, you can save up to 250 single use cups a year and nine kgs of carbon dioxide. And then if your workplace shifts, then we can save up to 25,000 single use cups and um, almost a thousand kgs of carbon dioxide. So reusable really is the solution and it really is the future. So I just encourage everyone to kind of switch towards reusable models. Cool, I'll end it there, but happy to take lots of questions. Sure, okay, that was Awesome to hear. Um, yeah, great stuff. And I'm super excited about the Circular Economy launch coming up. So I hope to see lots of you who are in this room there as well to hear more from Kate. Um, just because we've had a few people join who might have missed my first little bit, um, welcome. And we're just going through our speakers. And if you have any questions that you want to write down so you don't forget them, feel free to pop them in the chat. Or after Nada, who's our last speaker, who'll come up in a moment, and um, we'll have a Q&A where you can say it out loud if you'd like to chat. And yeah, feel free to um, put on your cameras if you like while you're doing that. So our last speaker today is Nada from Again Again. So I will let her take it away. Thank you. Again Again. Again Again is a reusable, is currently a reusable coffee cup share network. So we, um, we work with about 180 cafes around the country and we have what we call a fleet of cups, reusable cups, steady steel cups and lids uh, in these cafes and customers can borrow the cups at any of them. They pay a $3 deposit. <laughs> they, have a th they pay a $3 deposit um, and they borrow one of our cups. The cups can be returned at any of those cafes and when the cup comes back into the network, then $3 is refunded to the customer. So we've been in market now for about uh, two years. Um, I, I'm not gonna go through the reasons as to why we started this because Kate, you did an extraordinary job of <laughs> explaining all of that. New Zealand currently throws away 295 million single use cups each year. Just with the cups, that's about 5,000 tonnes of waste, and that's not that's not then looking at the other single-use um, packaging items, such as, you know, the curry um, the curry bottles or the sushi trays. Just the cups, 5,000 tonnes. Um, it's very easy, I think, for people to have their one cup and to disregard it as being of uh, issue because it's such a tiny um, component. But of course, it's the collection of all of those individual units that is the problem. Um, and the systems that we have been developing and are about to um, bring to the market um, with respect to other containers are all looking at providing an easy way for end users to make better choices in the moment. So on that note, um, I am going to skip over the, the why we would do all of this and I'm going to move straight to what is it that makes a good reusable system. And then I'd like to introduce to you what we're um, about to bring to market. So a fair bit of um, what I'm gonna show you hasn't been seen yet and isn't available. It's not even on our own website yet, um, but really looking forward to giving it its, um, its first outing. So let me share my screen. So, what makes a good um, reusable system? There are three things that a reusable system needs. Uh, no matter how big or small your reusable system that you're looking to um, develop is, they need those three, those three components. So the first is that you need to choose your containers. 
The second, that you need to manage them, and the third, that you need to wash them. And on the surface, that sounds really simple. In practice, um, that is uh, a whole other story. So containers, uh, ideally containers need to suit the food and drinks that the hospitality operators are already serving. So systems like ours, where we have a, a, um, a, a shared container amongst many cafes, on one hand, give benefit because there is an interoperable nature of them, but on the other hand, actually, they come up short for a lot of um, different types of hospitality wares. And so I, we really firmly believe that the container that is going to make the system work for the vendor is the container that the vendor identifies to be right for them. So I've got a bunch of containers here um, that you can see, and some of those, of course, are ours with the again again branding on them, but some of them might be the containers that cafes could choose uh, to put into market that is right for them. Second up is the management. I think there's a few different ways you can look at that. Um, on the surface of it, um, the cash deposit and return model is, is certainly the most simple and, and uh, easiest to implement, but it does have some drawbacks. And then thirdly um, is the washing. Now, again, again, can help with these first two, the containers and the way to manage it. This last one here really is society's great problem. Um, washing, if, you, if we're working with cafes who've already got wash um, facilities in place, then it starts easily. But even then, once we get to scale, we find that that puts quite a lot of pressure on the systems. For a lot of um, uh, outlets, they actually just don't have the capacity to wash at all. If you think about coffee carts who are serving only into single use containers, and then at the other end, the events, um, venues which are, are serving um, without the infrastructure, the permanent infrastructure behind them. Um, finding a wash, wash solution in those situations is actually really, really tricky. So um, we have, again, again, really has limited our, um, our solutions to those first two issues. And um, the third one we acknowledge is, is a really big problem and um, probably one of the greatest opportunities for business development, I think at the moment, um, because it just it really doesn't ex exist anywhere. So, Going through the um, fleet options, it needs to be fit for service, it needs to be economical, and it needs to be, uh, and it can be interoperable. I think that last one, the interoperability, is really important to think about. If, you, um, if you're a cafe and you're looking to find containers, then there is some value in having those containers um, be, be able to be shared amongst um, more than one cafe. It gives the consumer um, the opportunity of receiving them in one place and not having to go back directly to that place to um, return them. So I think there's a lot of value uh, in that. I'd like to introduce you to this shared fleet that we are about to bring in. So you can see the paper sleeved um, cup at the back, which is our original cup. It's still very much in our fleet, but the paper sleeve itself is problematic for some people. It does offer, um, it does offer a really economical option for cafes. And we chose the single walled steel cup with the paper sleeve over a plastic cup because of our concerns with the true circular nature of the plastic. Um, Kate's absolutely on the mark though. Anything that's single use is a problem in itself. And so there are people who are not comfortable with that sleeve either. Um, paper recycling in New Zealand is, a, is a, um, a functional, albeit very oversubscribed recycle stream. And so there are pros and cons. And we chose what we felt was the, uh, was the, best, um, the best material choices on balance. However, for people who really don't want that, um, we're now bringing in the double walled um, containers. And you can see we've got two coffee cups coming and in an in a, um, insulated bowl at the back too. The problem, of course, with them is that there's twice as much steel in them. So if you look at the LCA, then, then the amount of emissions that are coming out from the extraction of that steel obviously doubles. Um, and of course, um, uh, economically, they, they're also challenging, they're expensive. And so um, we couldn't put a double walled cup into a, into a deposit return system um, because it was just going to be too expensive. We were going to have to charge people a minimum of about $10 per cup. And then actually you get into the realms of people um, uh, feeling like they've purchased it rather than borrowed it and um, feeling that that's too much. They don't, that's beyond what they're prepared to make a commitment to sustainability for. Um, 
the next set of containers are the ones that are branded for the individual company. So this is not, this we haven't started seeing this in New Zealand an awful lot yet, um, but overseas increasingly we're seeing large chains who are bringing in their own um, interoperable containers. So there's a salad um, chain in uh, New York, for example, that now has their own branded container and um, you get a discount with your salad next time you bring it back and you use it again. So I think we're going to start to see more and more of this. Um, and the um, I think that's excellent. We want to support that. Um, the tricky thing, of course, is how do you manage it without losing the value that the companies invest into it? And then thirdly, I'd just bring your attention to the fact that plastics, we believe, have their place. Um, we are not going to have plastics in our marketplace, and we are not going to have plastics in our, um, in our own brand interoperable system. But I think it's really important to recognise that plastics in themselves are not the problem. The problem is how they're being used. And plastics do give some, some really fantastic advantages. Actually, from an LCA perspective, a polypropylene reusable container is in fact better than a stainless steel container. So there are lots of values which, um, about plastic which support that they're, a, they're an um, appropriate container in a reuse system. Um, but they're also super cheap. And so if we're looking, for example, if we could, if we can envision a time where you go to the supermarket deli counter and there's no single use containers there, it's likely that for a broad mass market appeal and to fit into the um, financial requirements of, of FMCG like that, that we're going to be looking at a replacement reusable container, but that is also in the polypropylene, just has a longer lifespan. With respect to the management, um, deposit return, I, um, I uh, is what we've got in play currently. So um, I talked through that before, $3 in, $3 out, and the cafe um, sanitizes the, the container. There is absolutely a place for a cash model. And the reason that we say that is that in order to actually replace single use uh, packaging and not simply offer an, offer an alternative to the people who you know, might want to engage in that, if we're going to take society on this journey and actually get rid of single use packaging, then vendors who are selling, for example, coffee, need to be able to sell coffee to every single person that works, walks through the door. And if they if they um, don't have a cash model at a really affordable price to do that, then they're limited to only selling coffee to people who have downloaded the chosen app that they're using. And of course, from a commercial perspective, that isn't acceptable. So we believe that there is absolutely a place for this deposit and refund um, model to continue. But we um, also believe that there's a place for technology um, that will come in. So with a te technology platform, we um, we can protect the investment of higher value containers. Um, and also for the people who don't want to deal with cash and there are vendors and customers alike who hate it, uh, we can take that out of that um, equation and use the technology to, to manage the, um, the exchange of value when that borrow and return transaction takes place. So this is what we're coming up with. Um, this is all very much pre-launch. So in about two weeks time, we will be going into a closed beta um, testing and a couple of weeks after that into an open beta testing where we will have um, technology taking the place of the deposit and return. So you can see here, it's still very much circular, but there's two things I'd, um, I'd draw your attention to. The first is that on issue, remember here that the, the vendors have purchased some stock, whatever that stock is. It might be our stock, it might be some of their own, but ultimately they've spent some money on it. When the, when the container is issued, they're not, if they're not receiving the deposit back from the um, customer, then at the point of issue, the tech now takes responsibility for tracking that, um, con that container. The, the vendor doesn't get any money back for that container in that moment. But then the other um, thing that happens is that if that container doesn't come back, then the technology system firstly will charge the end user for it. So making the end user responsible for the container that they've now um, got in their own possession. And then the container can be replaced to the vendor at no extra cost to them. So although the vendor doesn't get the money back at the start, they do get the value back eventually. If the cup or the container comes back, then everybody's in, everybody's equal anyway. So there's no further um, need for management in that. So on that note, um, I would like to show you what we've what we've come up with. And the first thing I'll do actually is to um, play you a 90 second video that gives you an overview of what's to come. 
Again Again's vision is that reusables are normal for takeaways everywhere. In hundreds of cafes around the country, our established reusable coffee cup share system is now making a significant dent into cup waste. But the full scale of the single-use packaging waste problem entirely dwarfs this. To change the playbook and make reusables accessible and easy for all takeaways, we really need a whole range of reusable containers. We need retailers of all types on board, from cafes to takeaway outlets to breweries to grocery stores. And we need an easy way for people to borrow and return those containers, as easily as borrowing books from a library. Again Again is working on this now. What's coming is libraries of containers in your pocket. Cafes and other food and beverage retailers can have the containers on hand that best suit the takeaway food and drinks that consumers are already purchasing. It's easy for them to operate, and it's really easy and convenient for consumers. With Again Again's new app, you're able to order, take away, and enjoy your favourite Kai and Anu just as before. With a reusable container in your care, you'll find it in your app, on the shelf. Best of all, you'll borrow the container for free, and it stays free as long as you remember to get it back in time. Again Again is building this future right now. And you can pre-register for early access to the app and to join this movement to make reusables normal and takeaways everywhere. Right, so uh, that's a very early, um, thanks Kate, that's a very early look. That's actually the first time that we've played that video publicly. So. We would be um, beta testing this week um, if it wasn't for COVID. That's been pushed out a couple of weeks, but we're really only about uh, three weeks away from a more open test. And then actually by the end of this year, we would expect to have that um, in market and available across the country. The exciting thing, of course, is that we also have this other fleet coming in. So we can move beyond the coffee cups and actually move into servicing um, hospitality and actually grocery businesses. Um, you saw that Get Garage Project was in there. Garage Project is part of our beta testing group and we will be working with them to replace their brown PET plugin. So that's that PET that's basically worthless and um, contaminate it, contaminates the clear PET uh, streams. So we're working with them to um, replace that with a glass plugin. I would, um, so actually, uh, how can I do this? So. This is the prototype, clearly it will look a lot sexier than this, but this is the prototype that will be going um, onto, the cafe uh, onto the cafe counters. From now, um, forward, from now on going forward, as an end user, you will pull up your uh, app. Where is mine? You will pull up your app and you land here on your shelf. And so from your shelf, you can already see there that I've um, borrowed three containers over the course of the last probably a couple of days. Um, but now I want to borrow a new one. So I simply go to the to the borrow, I, I scan that. It's an NFC tag that we're using, which is a higher security than a, than a QR code. I scan that and it comes up and it says, I see you're at Mojo Aurora. They're one of our testing partners. These are the containers. This is actually dummy data. So Mojo Aurora doesn't sell beer, <laughs> but there you go. Uh, these are the containers that Mojo um, have got on offer, what would you like? And I say, I'd like a regular cup, please. And I want to borrow that. And it comes up with a validation screen. So when there is an exchange of value, just like when you purchase a pie at the dairy, you're going to have to exchange some value in return for that and you, and, and you pay for it. It's the current workflow that the entire world uses. Once we go cashless, there needs to be an exchange of value that is, um, that is validated. And so the exchange of value happens inside the app but the validation of it is simply visual. You just say the barista or the person on the counter will need to see the validation screen so that they know that that has taken place. And now the app in the background has given me um, the, oh, I've just achieved a milestone. So we're tracking people's um, achievements as they go along. Let me get rid of that. So you can now see that that, um, that container is now on my shelf and it will sit there on my shelf until I return it. Um, as a general rule, containers, people are given two weeks to return a container, um, at which stage 
they will be notified they're coming up on that due date. If they go into extra time, there'll be a $3 fee. And then if they still don't return the container in a week, then that um, container will be replaced and therefore they'll be charged a replacement fee. Um, on the other end, the uh, vendors can, um, can track what, has, what containers have gone out from them and then gone back in. And at the end of the month, let's say a, a cafe has checked out um, 100 cups and they've had 50 returned, if they're 50 cups short, then again, again, we'll replace those containers at no further charge to the vendors because we will have given that responsibility to the end users by that stage. So that's pretty much it. Um, super exciting times to be on the brink of bringing this to market. Um, we believe that we've got something that is unique internationally. Internationally, every other system that we're aware of tracks the container and not the transaction. Um, and the value of tracking the transaction, we believe, is that we can actually service any container for any hospitality business um, of their choice. And um, it gives quite a lot of... Um, quite a lot of flexibility to the system that can be applied across many industries. It also has a corporate application where we can service large companies to have a fleet of their own containers that then their customers, uh, then their staff can either use from their kitchens or in fact they can put those containers into the local cafes where the staff can borrow it from there. So there's two sides of that, um, that community that we're servicing and yeah we really are looking forward to bringing it to market and to having people share this journey with us as we try and change society's behaviour. Thanks very much, Namahinu. Kia ora, Nara. That was awesome. So cool to hear all about your guys' plans and exciting that the Now crowd and you guys all get this kind of sneak preview. So I imagine yeah. that, um, <laughs> lots, of, lots of the people in this call will be the people taking it up and we've already had um, in the chat people asking for that link again. So we'll make sure we circulate that so that we can have you guys yeah, so that, give it a go. That link at the moment, we're really asking for Wellington based people and um, simply because that's where we're doing our early beta testing. Um, but we, um, like I say, bringing it to the market by the end of the year. So there'll be plenty of opportunities. Fantastic. I'll put um, that link in the, in the chat actually. Yeah, cool. And we can send some more info and a follow-up email to you all. Um, great. Well, such great speakers. I think that gave a really good um, kind of overview of a few different things happening in the circular economy space from kind of the big stuff that Ruth was talking about, the more individual stuff Kate was talking about, and the exciting new kind of businesses that are appearing like again and again. Um, so we do have a few questions in the chat, so we can start with them and then we can open it up if anyone wants to um, put their hand up and ask anything. Um, so I'll just go up a moment. Um, a question for you, Ruth. We have um, Junk Run are currently, are they only operating in Auckland? Do you guys have any plans to expand further across the country or know maybe of other people doing stuff um, around the country? Yeah, we, we are based in Auckland at the moment um, and nothing at the stage to officially launch anywhere else, but um, it depends what area people are in um, I may be able to sort of offer a few ideas but uh, we really specialize to be honest in the Auckland market cool thank you um, next we have um, what are your thoughts and, and this can be to the entire panel as well your thoughts around the LDPE recycling to things such as fence posts where they will degrade and form microplastics in the environment still better to recycle over landfilling and containing so I guess that's the system where our soft plastics are getting created into fence posts I think um the, yeah the current soft plastic uh, recycling scheme offers a good interim solution but uh, we should be looking to kind of move away from this idea of just creating more and more fence posts. We really need to um, get the, the products into kind of more long life packaging that can be washed and reused rather than- Yeah, I agree, um, I agree. Just yeah, uh, well, well, the alternative is sending the plastics off offshore to be recycled. So that is a good step forward that we're using in, uh, locally here in New Zealand for um, but yes, I think we just need to stop using so much plastic, basically. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say the same. We need to stop creating yeah. it. Um, that said, you know, we've become so entrenched in our single use habits. And, you know, I, I would wager that even amongst a group of people who are really connected and interested in this area that we're still using single use plastics. So I think it's going to be a long time before that um, actually uh, is 
it is designed out completely and in the interim period reusing things is definitely better than labeling them because those plastics exist anyway so whether they go into fence posts and then the land or whether they go straight into landfill the the problem is still there yeah yeah great and yeah it is um that single use is going to be hard um to move away from quickly i've even noticed in the sort of last lockdown it's even harder right now to avoid with I'm saving up all my soft plastics to then deposit, but even like trying to buy things at the moment, a lot seems to be packaged and refilleries aren't open. So I guess it's, yeah, it's going to be a long journey. Um, it, the biggest hurdle to that journey, I, I really firmly believe, and I say this from a point of view of having essentially solved the, the management part of it, but it's the washing. So mm -hmm. at the moment, we simply don't have the infrastructure to do the washing. And everyone, everyone says, ah, oh, it's easy. We'll just, you know, we'll just, we've already got a dishwasher. We'll do it. But doing it at scale is actually really, really tricky. And so then if you're looking at, at that in relation to the soft plastics, for example, then who's going to be, who's going to be washing the containers that are going to replace the soft plastics in the grocery capacity? That is an enormous question mm -hmm. that hasn't even started to be answered. Yeah, that's a really interesting piece of the cycle that I guess is kind of, um, I wouldn't have thought about it straight away, but you're right, it is kind of like a key link that we need to solve for that to work at scale. Um, another question we have here is about, um, what about bin liners that are compostable? Are they still bad for landfill? It's, um, it's really challenging. <laughs> there's, there's no kind of silver bullet here. So if we look to kind of uh, maybe compostable bin liners that are made from biomaterials, then um, the source of the, that material is from a renewable source. But unfortunately, when it goes into landfill, will break down um, anaerobically into methane, whereas your traditional bin liner is made from a petrochemical source, which is, again, problematic, um, but is more inert in the landfill. So it's a, it's a pretty tough one to... Um, <laughs> to choose the right solution for, but maybe, um, yeah, maybe our other panelists can give, give their opinion. Um, my understanding is compostable bin liners are really only meant to go into compost. <laughs> Not great for landfill, um, but, you know, you've got to change society behaviour. How do you get your rubbish from your kitchen to your, to your landfill bin? That's basically the, the problem that needs to be solved. Um, yeah, so we're trying to get people to change that piece of behavior, um, maybe just switching to newspaper and all those other things that people like us who are committed to this sort of management would, would do, um, that, that's the big problem. Mm. So yeah, and certainly can't go into recycling because it's just jams up the machines. Yeah. Yeah, I think often when there's um, a solution that seems like it's the, the perfect one, often it's a lot more complicated than it first seems. Sustainability mm -hmm. often doesn't have a one a one trick answer or a silver bullet, as Kate said, it's, it's always more complicated than that. Um, this is quite an interesting one. What is the true definition for single use? A coffee cup is an easy one to think of, but what about the bag of frozen peas and the plastic it comes in? Is that counted as single use as well? I like to think of it as um, maybe like single use and disposable could, could almost be thought of as a similar term. So something that is designed to be thrown away once you've finished using it. Yep. Um, and, and so, yeah, so a bag of frozen peas, I would, I would consider disposable and single use. Yep, I agree. <laughs> I, I do think though it's worth recognizing that there is um, extra function that's being formed, being done by the frozen pea bag, for example, if you're looking at single use in the context of grabbing a grabbing a bowl of curry at a street event, you're talking about a, a 12 minute use case, as opposed to something that is actually, or actually the, the really great example is the plastic that's around cucumbers. So the plastic around cucumbers is absolutely single use, but it extends the life of the cucumber by something like 10 times and therefore mm. massively reduces the waste of the cucumber. So in terms of what that plastic is doing that is quite considerably more than the 12 minutes that the plastic plate at the festival is doing and yeah. in that respect I think it um, is reasonable to to look at those two things as different um, with different urgencies. 
Yeah, yeah. they have they serve different functional purposes in meeting the needs of the product, but um, we can always look for better ways to meet the needs of those products, which is what Nada's doing with, with her <laughs> um, amazing technology. <laughs> yeah. yeah, again, I never, never one simple answer that's kind of often no. is a case by case um, sort of discussion. Um, cool, we've, we've only got uh, one uh, time for one more question. Um, one here we have is just wondering what circular economy slash reusability could look like in other consumer categories such as cosmetics or product based. Um, so I know that Kate will have something to say and might even tell you to just come along to her next thing to talk more yeah. about this. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. So huge opportunity for circular economy um, and much broader than just food packaging and packaging in general. Um, we've, as I said, we've, we've undertaken a bit of a state of the nation report for, for what's going on here in New Zealand. And in that report, we've, we've spoken to, you know, 50 um, really influential organisations right across the value chain and right across all kind of sectors and what they're doing in the circular economy. So some great examples um, that we can share there. In the cosmetics, I'd look to somebody like Emma Lewisham. She's doing some pretty cool things. Um, and product-based, I, I really um, I really like Maggie Marilyn is another, is a good example of a New Zealand clothing designer who's really um, changing the thinking around, um, around that textiles and, and clothing. But yeah, come along on the 22nd of September and, and you can download our latest report. Oh, well, we've just um, hit 11 o'clock, so we are going to have to cut it there, but um, we will do a follow-up email and have some links to where you can get some more info and um, contact details for our amazing speakers. Thank you guys so, so, so much. It was so interesting to hear what you had to say. Yeah, one um, more shameless plug. <laughs> we've also got um, on the 19th of November, SBN's hosting our Packaging Masterclass, which is going to be huge. We're kind of divulging into the packaging system. Nada was supposed to be talking at it, but um, we're going to be showing her, her, her product there. Um, but yeah, come along to that and, and learn about all of the things you need to know and with regards to packaging and packaging design. But yeah, thanks. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah and so great to see or have you guys all here and um, I hope that our next now crowd event I can see you all lovely faces in person and we'll be out of lockdown so um, look out for an email coming to your inbox and the rain's just started here so that's probably quite loud for you guys but um, thank you so much and uh, yeah kia ora. thank you kia ora kia ora kia ora tato kia ora tato